Awesome. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you to everyone who's here today. I know that the people behind the scenes have put a lot of effort into making this work. Um, and we're all here for it. So without further ado, let us welcome our guest, Phil Hilberton. Phil Hilberton is a recovering CPA and has earned his advanced degree at the College of Hard Knocks, achieving the title of Dr. No. As in, no, you cannot spend that, and no, you cannot have that. Uh, which is the mantra of all CFOs. However, his business curiosity extended to more fully appreciate the Excuse me. All right, I'm not sure if I'm getting um, old, an old feed. I'm getting some uh, echo, sorry guys. All right, I'm just gonna start from the top, sorry about that. Uh, so we're welcoming our guest, Phil Holberton. Uh, he's a recovering CPA and he has earned his uh, advanced degree at the College of Hard Knocks, achieving the title of Dr. No. As in, no, you cannot spend that and no, you cannot have that, the mantra of all CFOs. However, his business curiosity extended to more fully appreciate the whole business leading to assignments and operations and becoming a CEO of a biotech company. His unexpected appointment as senior warden of his church and appointment as leadership professor gave him the opportunity to flex the right side of his brain. He is a later bloomer in many ways, uh, having earned his black belt in karate at the age of 59. Wow. Um, all of this adds up to his full life of experiences that he will share with us today. Uh, please help me welcome Betty Holberton's nephew, Phil Holberton, to inspire our future ambitions. All right. well, thank, thank you very much, Derek. I appreciate that. And I appreciate being here and interacting with the uh, panelists. And uh, um, I'll, I'll wait the first question. All right. Um, Phil, would you mind telling us about Betty Holberton and what made her such a great problem solver? Well, Betty Holberton uh, had a very, very uh, strong analytical brain. And uh, believe it or not, when she went to school at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, she was she was she wanted to join the math department. And the professor in the math department said, "Uh, uh you got to go to home ec or political science or journalism or some other department." And um, that began her career of of uh, saying, "I'm not going to take no for an answer." Uh, and she was just. She was very, very intelligent uh, woman, and she had a very strong voice in what she believed in, and uh, she just uh, went about it. And her problem-solving skills, well, I'm sure we'll get to a little bit longer, further down in the uh, line of uh, conversation here, because uh, she really got to use them quite a bit. That's great. Well, I hope we get to that. And uh, Phil, if you're willing, would you be willing to talk about yourself and maybe a little bit more about what you do and why you chose to be a mentor to those in leadership? Well, as my um, the thank you for the introduction, the kind of introduction, I'm sort of a recovering CFO. So, um, you know, uh, I was a CFO for probably 40 years. And at some point in time in life, you know, you sort of outgrow that a little bit. And as life events happen, uh, you get thrown into situations where, um, wow, I didn't know that existed. And so I was a senior warden of our church and uh, <clears throat> I, I was immediately thrown into a leadership uh, position in, in a spiritual community of, um, and these are all volunteers. So you know, being a leader in that kind of environment is is quite interesting. And it has to do with uh, your heart and your spirituality and, and so forth. And, 
You know, when I was about 55 years old, I said, well, what am I going to do when I really get old? And I decided that I wanted to become an adjunct uh, professor. So I uh, got a teaching gig at Brandeis University, which is a very well-known university in uh, uh, Boston area. And for 18 years, I, um, I ran a leadership course there. First nine years were uh, in the classroom, and the, the following nine years was uh, uh, online. So I've got the best of both worlds. So that's where I had developed my interest um, in uh, teaching. And remember the biotech company I told you about? Well, one, one biotech company before that uh, was a public company, and um, we were in our um, uh, board meeting, and the CEO uh, basically got fired in the board meeting um, by the venture capitalists, you know, the investors, uh, public investors. So they uh, stopped the meeting, and they went into his office, and they talked, and my office is right next to him. And then after the meeting was done, he walked into my office. And he says, what do I do now, Phil? And at that point in time, I became his coach. I helped him coach a successful exit from a company. I helped him, helped him coach uh, what his termination package should be, uh, how to present it to the public so it would look like it was a normal stepping down in the whole nine yards. And uh, and I felt really empowered because I was helping another human being. So that sort of was the first uh, first journey into uh, my coaching career. And uh, I haven't looked back since, basically. That's wonderful to hear. It's uh, really impressive. Um, is it all right if we ask some, some questions about Betty now? Sure. I don't know if I can answer them. <laughs> OK. Uh, is it true in the beginning? due to ENIAC, the project Betty was working on, being classified, she and other computers could only work from diagrams and blueprints? True. So uh, as I understand the story, um, she, um, um, six of the best of the brightest were the computers who were helping um, program the um, atil artillery and all the, uh, uh, during World War II. So they, invited six of the best and brightest to come in and they unveiled, unveiled this new computer. And uh, uh, it was as big as most rooms are these days, you know what I mean? And uh, uh, they handed uh, the plans to Betty and her five cohorts. And they say, all we do is have the wiring diagrams and uh, you gotta go and figure it out and help us program this. And that's how it, that's to my best recollect, recollection of uh, how it all got started. And boy, those women, as smart as they were, they figured it out. And uh, we're, we're, we're grateful for her past because that was the first computer um, basically in the United States, the Antioch. Yeah, I appreciate you speaking to that. That's actually one of the things I was curious about when I was reading about her history. Um, not only some of the limitations that she had in terms of it being classified and only being able to work from blueprints in the beginning, but also some of the social limitations that she may have experienced in terms of discrimination and dealing with that. Uh, in particular, I know that at that time, uh, the people who were doing the raw computation called the computers were usually at a social stratum below the engineers. They were considered assistants to the engineers because they did the raw calculation. They were even called sub-professionals at the time. Right. So my, my curiosity there was um, given that from the accounts I've heard of Betty's work, even towards the beginning, she had some creative freedom and she was able to engineer her own solutions and be trusted in that. Uh, what was her relationship with outside leadership or her team's relationship with outside leadership like? Did they have to develop that creative freedom over time or was it granted to them early on? I wish I knew the answer to that question. So I don't really know her as well as uh, some other people portrayed her. I mean, she was my distant aunt, not, not distant, but uh, uh, separated by geography. And, you know, we'd see each other at weddings and social events and so forth. So it's not like I saw her every summer. In, in fact, one little, one, 
one little story after she got uh, the Ava Lovelace um, Award, um, I um, I picked up the Wall Street Journal on the uh, on a uh, Friday afternoon, and 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 the Wall Street Journal has in the back page an investigative um, reporting, and I looked, and I said, "Geez, I recognize that face. That's my Aunt Betty." Well. Aunt Betty was already in a nursing home because she had a stroke. Um, but over the course of two weeks, these investigative reporters uh, interviewed uh, Betty and sort of uh, talked to her and got a lot more information. So I learned as much from reading those articles as I knew from her before, to be honest with you. All right. Um, Going to transition into more leadership questions. Um, when is it necessary to sacrifice individual needs to fulfill team goals? And how do you reconcile these differences afterwards? Uh, well, I think the most important uh, attribute of any company, any organization is you have a, a vision and a mission statement and you have some culture that helps you get there. So the interests of the company precede the interests of any individual and any team. So, I'm often reminded of uh, of the event that, um, and many of you may not know this event, but um, Johnson and Johnson, oh, I'm going to guess 20 years ago, had um, somebody uh, was in a Chicago drugstore, and they tampered with Tylenol, and they put a uh, a poison in it, and um, I, I I can't remember exactly how many people were killed, but. Uh, it was devastating to America. And uh, so the CEO at that point in time says, I don't care how much it costs. We're taking all the product off the shelf and we're going to all start over on Tylenol. Now, Tylenol was the biggest brand in the, in the world. But see, no one person trumped the ideal mission. Our customers come first and we protect our patients and our users of our product. And I've, I heard rumors, not rumors, but I, I think I read somewhere where it might have cost them $250 million or a half a billion dollars uh, to do that and where they could have probably done something different. But that showed integrity. So you have to live to, I don't want to say a higher power, but you have to have a, a, a higher North Star, which is usually organizationally driven. Yeah, it's good trying to align that people around that sense of purpose. I know that in the, the leadership experiences I've had, that can be a challenge. And given that, how should leaders best motivate their employees and try to build a sense of community? I mean, it seems to be the trick is to get them to be motivated to work under a sense of loyalty and, and allegiance to the sense of purpose instead of just rote uh, uh, obedience. That's a that's an excellent question, um, Sam, and I appreciate it. Um, the the most important thing about <clears throat> well, I, I think of leadership in two dimensions. <clears throat> I think of leadership a, a transactional leadership or transformational leadership. Now, let me just talk about the two types. Transactional leadership is when you have control of their paycheck, their bonus, uh, time off. And so somebody's working for the transaction. The best type of leadership is transformational. When they're, look, when they're working for you because they want to work for you and they aspire because you're a really good human being. Now, granted, it's hard for a lot of leaders to behave that way because they're brought up to be A-types and command and control. And when I work with uh, CEOs today, um, we spent a lot of time talking about putting water and sunshine on their uh, executive team and their people inside their organization, because if they grow, they will then be able to grow themselves. So I turn it around. And if you ever heard the concept of servant leadership, it's like flipping an organization chart around. The servant leader is always serving the organization. That's their higher power. Because... If you can inspire uh, an organization to reach for that North Star and achieve things that um, otherwise don't appear attainable, uh, you've done a really, really good job. 
Now, I'll give you an example. I've seen in this COVID period, some of our CEOs have uh, wrote, risen to the occasion more than I would ever imagine. So they're less, they're less about command and control, and they're more about how can I inspire my entire team to come with me and help us get through this COVID period. So it's, it's, it's not funny, but uh, just imagine, it takes a crisis sometimes to uh, get things done, uh, if that makes sense what I'm saying. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful to hear. It's uh, excellent to know. Um, how can one become smarter, more adaptable, and perhaps uh, most difficult, emotionally intelligent? Well, there are diagnostic tests to help you get a baseline on your emotional intelligence. You can sort of, um, you, you probably can take one or more of ones that have been sort of developed. Um, there's also, um, I advocate a test called uh, Mindsets by a professor in California, uh, Ryan Gottfriedson. Um, and uh, uh, it's free. And it will tell, it will help you understand whether you have a defensive posture or an offensive posture in sort of four different dimensions. And that's a good, that's a good starting point to um, uh, see where you are. When I was teaching at Brandeis, my students would ask me, are leaders born or are they made? What do you think my answer was? If I had to guess, I'd say a little bit of both. I'd say yes. Mm -hmm. Some have more natural talent than others, but like anything in life, you have to keep practicing. So, so some people may have zero to not even know, knowing what the word emotional intelligence means. Uh, and, and, and they may have absolutely incredible um, natural talent. So they don't have to they don't have to worry about it as much as people that it, it's, it's more awkward for. But I will tell you, and from my perspective, if you want to navigate uh, and get the best out of life, learning this skill is really, really important for you to learn over time. It will help you in your marriage. It will help you in your uh, community. It will help you in your business. Uh, I'd say learn that early and often uh, and practice it uh, because, look, I, I came from the accounting profession, right? CPAs, they're like engineers, you know, we're kind of, you know, left brain and this and that and so forth. But um, that only goes so far. Um, uh, left uh, uh, um, programmers and engineers and Accountants seem to be thinking black and white. Well, life is a lot different than black and white. There's a lot of uh, parameters to it. And you need uh, the ability to, uh, you need the ability to really understand this, what I call the shades of gray in, in life. And when you're working at a more senior level, it's really incumbent upon us all to understand risk because lots of uh, situations we're doing in the, in, the, in the world or in our business is based on risk. Do I have a bet the farm strategy? In other words, do I bet the, the whole company on a future strategy? Or do I sort of take it a piece at a time? So these are all skills that you uh, learn by working with others, um, learning to think strategically, and learning how to be adaptable. Yeah, I appreciate you speaking to that and actually covers some of what we were going to ask in our next question, which is why is emotional intelligence so important in today's world. But given that you've spoken to that a bit, I'm curious. I mean, we can all say that empathy is evergreen and social skills have always been important to anyone's success throughout history. But why do you think it is more recently there's been a focus on looking at emotional intelligence separately from IQ? Oh, that's a really excellent question. Um, I would say most hiring practices, uh, or in corporate America, for example, are really 
their first, um, they, they look at sort of two, two things. They look at your pedigree, you know, where you, where you grew up and all that kind of stuff. And they look and, and try to assess intellectually your intelligence. So no, nobody really, particularly if they're hiring people on the inbound side to help them, you know, start to grow with inside the company. So IQ has always been a, an important barometer for any hiring organization. I would say that's always the first part. I would say companies now are getting more sophisticated in understanding um, people's uh, emotional intelligence because they, they're beginning to recognize that, that this is a more important attribute uh, as people move up the ladder. I've seen, um, I've seen, um, I've seen statistics that um, seventy-five percent of the um, seventy-five percent of the people that work in a company um, like the company, but they don't like their boss. So that says something about your boss in, in terms of emotional intelligence. And if your boss is sort of oppressive, uh, it's going to make it very uh, um, hard to work for. That being said, I think emotional intelligence together with it, uh, you know, we as a society can get so much further. We, I mean, we, I mean, let's face it, we're in a competitive world. We're in competitive with different countries and the, and the whole nine yards. So if our labor, uh, by the way, um, and we can make them more productive and more um, uh higher performance, we're going to win in the total uh, world of what I call conscious capitalism. Now, I haven't mentioned that before, but conscious capitalism, uh, to me, has, has to do with, um, uh, has to do with um, not a return on investment for your stockholders, right? That's classic capitalism, but all your stakeholders, so what does that involve? That in involves customers, that involves vendors, that involves employees, that involves your board of directors, that involves everybody that's a stakeholder. And there's been some work that says, if you invest in developing and strengthening all those stakeholders, uh, the performance of your company actually will be, end up being better than the, those who are just classic capitalism. I mean, think of classic capitalism um, where there's many instances of companies in the United States that uh, went out of business because they couldn't innovate. They couldn't uh, make room for innovation. Uh, they couldn't figure out how to bring it on. Um, Kodak, for example, um, um, Xerox uh, machines. I mean, it, it's, just, uh, it's just amazing how many companies end up um, uh, doing that. We've even heard of, um, um, uh, what's his name? Sorry, I'm having a senior moment. Um, well, it'll come to me. Uh, a, a guy that, um, uh, good to great. Who wrote good to great? Um, uh, but anyway, good to great. And a lot of those companies are no longer around. So what happened is once they got there, they couldn't keep going. They couldn't keep uh, working to get better and better. So in any organization, uh, we need to keep working to get better and better. It's just, that's the way it is. And if we do that, we're going to have more fulfilling lives. Uh, we'll be happier. Uh, happier. Happiness is not measured in terms of the size of your bank account. Uh, happiness is, is measured by the size of your heart and the size of your heart is when you're given back either into your company or into your legacy or into the Holberton School or anything uh, along those lines. All right. Um, I'm going to ask some questions about current events now. <laughs> We'll try and keep it uh, away from <laughs> politics, but why is diversity important and how can we support minorities? Well, I'm happy to talk about this topic because um, for the last two weeks, 
this has been top of mind for my CEOs that I talk with. So we, we normally come in and talk about business problems, uh, but they could not get away um, from being, uh, uh, having a conversation around this. And I think uh, uh, current events has sort of brought it to the forefront that now it's much more important. So I have CEOs now trying to <clears throat> figure out what role they can play. Even, even as late as last night, we were talking, is there an organization that's underprivileged that we, we as a peer group could actually support, uh, mentor and uh, raise money for and the whole nine yards. Uh, the reason diversity is important is we're a, div we're a diverse country. Uh, we're a diverse nation and diversity is a strength. It's not a weakness. And if we treat it as a weakness, um, we'll have what I call um, a mindset that, um, you know, many of us might consider us racist. And I don't want to use that word in a, in a negative sense. I want to use that in a, a sense that many of us don't really understand it because, you know, we didn't have to face it growing up. I, use, I like to tell the story that uh, I used, I was raised in a high school and we had uh, African Americans or um, uh, on my, on our football team. And uh, we were like brothers from a different mother. And that's just a metaphor. But um, at the end of practice, they would go home to their neighborhood. And at the end of practice, I would go home to my neighborhood. And I never gave it two cents. So when we have relationships with uh, diverse people, we usually don't have a problem. It's when we don't have a relationship with them, we all typecast them from some way. So I'd say diversity is one of uh, America's um, largest challenges. And it has to be solved on many, many fronts. And I'm not going to make this a political discussion because that doesn't, it doesn't serve any purpose. Um, but uh, corporate America can do um, uh, an awful lot to help. I mean, you've seen uh, uh, Tim Cook from Apple uh, write a letter to shareholders and, and to his employees about, you know, this is something we have to grapple with and do something about. And the latest conversation we have with my CEOs is we have to look at our hiring practices. If, if we have a mental model that says we put a ad in a certain journal and that's where people come from, we'll never change it. So we have to go and really examine. And as I said to one of my CEOs, I said, it's like baseball players. You know, they start, they start developing their skills when they're eight or nine. So you got to find where these young engineers of color are and find out where they are in this ecosystem and then sort of nurture them along so they can come in. Uh, and that's, I mean, you just got to start earlier and sooner and change the way you think about um, introducing diversity in, into your uh, companies. And then, uh, you know, and then of course we have the other problem, uh, 400 years of, uh, you know, slavery in this country is uh, just, uh, you know, it's a nightmare. Well, I think you already spoke a bit to our next question, which is in particular, what can we do as software engineers to support diversity? Um, I imagine that Betty was chosen as our namesake because she was an engineer who represented an underrepresented uh, minority. Uh, you spoke to the issue of being proactive and going out and finding young engineers of color in their communities. And you also spoke to the issue of uh, how to use your voice and how broadly to cast your message, like advertising in certain journals versus not in others. Is there anything that you'd be willing to add in terms of what you've learned about how those of us in STEM specifically can support diversity? So one of the things that I'm inspired by at the Holberton Group is it's a diverse organization. I mean, it prides itself on um, admitting students of diverse backgrounds, nationality, color, uh, ethnic, ethnicity, the whole nine yards. So the Holberton School in and of itself is, is, a, living, is a living practice of what needs to go on in this world. Um, 
as one of my CEOs says, it's our behaviors that count. It's not our talk. And your behaviors are you're inviting people of different nationalities uh, to come in in different stages of their career, which is uh, a wonderful, wonderful attribute. I would also um, 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 opine that the more you get to know people that are not of the same ethnic ethnicity as yourself, build those friendships, build those, build those uh, strengths. Uh, make sure you uh, include time in your schedule every day to build those relationships. So when you go work for a company, and let's say you get it, uh, you come into the company and, you know, let's say they have a couple hundred programmers or people that are working there. Get to know the people first. That's more important than, uh, than, the, uh, than all the technical skills. Uh, having those relationships uh, is really, really important. And I encourage every man and woman, uh, Black, Asian, American, Indian, uh, re regardless of the nationality, get to know your people first. Get to know your peers, get to know your bosses. Um, we're all human beings. <clears throat> and even though they might be a boss, they, they, why would my CEOs bring this topic to talk about? Because they had nowhere else to talk about. But they know it and they're bothered by it. Um, so anything you talk about, People are going to have an interest in, in uh, sort of identifying with you. I think that would be really helpful for anybody that's moving in out of an academic environment into a work environment and sort of building their career. Build those relationships. And I would say that was one of my downfalls. See, when I was in the accounting uh, uh, business, I always thought my answers were correct. You know, the number said this, the number said that. Well, I didn't realize there was a whole part of business I didn't really understand. And part of it was I didn't really fully appreciate getting to know my colleagues. You know, I'd mostly go to war with them as opposed to um, uh, try to uh, uh, identify with them and sort of get to know them as people. So I, I like to say I'm a late bloomer. I need to unmute myself. <laughs> when a leader makes a um, mistake, how do they move on from that? Um, how do they apologize to their um, community and make uh, things better for everyone? Well, one of the, <clears throat> uh, well, first of all, it's, I'm sorry. Um, that's, that's usually is, it goes a long way. But I'm learning a lot about communications in my job now as, as working with CEOs. And there's difference between communications that come from the head and communications that come from the heart. So if you say, I'm sorry, from the head, forget it. Nobody will, nobody will see it and, and nobody will believe it. But if you come and you talk from the heart, and a lot of CEOs find that hard, you know, because they're on defense. They want to sort of have a, uh, a a strong view of themselves. They don't want to be vulnerable. You know, I, I encourage anybody on this uh, webinar to uh, follow Brene Brown and her work on vulnerability. I think it's one of the best. She is one of the most sought after forefront of thinkers in terms of emotional intelligence and sort of vulnerability and how to behave as a leader. But you have to, you have to say it from your heart. Um, and sometimes if you're not programmed that way, you have to really, I always say, tur turn on your music, turn up your microphone, and just, you know, like you're journaling, but journal from the heart. And usually you'll have something that will start to work there. So I've had several CEOs in the last week give me communications they want to share with their staff. And I've said, yeah, technically this is this is fine, but it's not coming from the heart. And you'll be far more effective if it comes from the heart. So everybody needs to develop these skills. And uh, and I'm I'm I would not say uh, that I'm perfect here either. Um, but it's something I have to work on all the time. Talk 
with lots of empathy. And that, that goes a long way. Yeah, I think it does in many situations. Um, but again, I, I, I would ask a question that maybe focuses it to our frame of reference, just because while many of us can hear these things and I think uh, we can see them in action in others' lives, I noticed that in software engineering in particular, it attracts a certain personality type that defaults towards focusing in a more introvert fashion on intellectual work typically. And given that's the case, uh, I'd be wondering if you'd be willing to speak to that specific frame of reference that we experience as students of software engineering. Why should software engineers care about leadership qualities? Because it may not always be obvious to us if we see that as something that manifests in more outwardly extrovert people. Well, um, the, the easy answer is um, because you want upward mobility in your career. So if, 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 if you're an introvert and want to be an introvert, uh, long term, you, you know, you're putting a cap on your own career, I think uh, would be my assess. I would also encourage people to read uh, Susan Cain's work. Um, she's done a lot of work around being an introvert. She was a lawyer that's turned into a, a well-known well national star on uh, moving from intro, in, being an introvert to an extrovert. And, you know, she's very well thought of leader in this whole area. Um, I, th I think there's probably ways that you can figure out how to um, practice uh, different skills to help you sort of, I don't want to say shed the introversion. I mean, look, uh, let's face it. If we want to grow, we have to shed some of our, you know, our upbringing. If you don't want to grow and you're happy with that, you won't be adaptable and you'll be an introvert. And then there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I don't want to poo poo it by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I always like to say no pain, no gain. So sometimes you have to have a little pain in order to get to where you might want to get to. Uh, and where you might want to get to is up to what you want to do. It's your passion. You have to decide what your passion is. And uh, your passion may be uh, uh, programming computers at a you know, at a very modest and early level. And, and that's fine if, that's, if that makes you and your family and everybody else happy. A lot of people it doesn't make happy. So uh, they're always trying to sort of break out of that. How can I become the full person I want to become? And, um, and so you, I would say spend 10 to 15% of your life um, thinking about um, uh, external uh, ways to uh, continue to uh, become more conversant with your own uh, skills and um, your own development needs. Uh, we all need to be developed. So try to figure out what those development needs are. <clears throat> That's why coaching is a big uh, profession now because athletes have coaches, executives have coaches, or life coaches, or career coaches, or coaches all around and um, lots of people hire coaches to try to help them navigate those waters because it's hard to do it by yourself. Let's put it that way. Um, you shared with us an infographic, um, the panelist um, that shows what you believe to be ideal leadership skills. Could you um, give us a real life example of an excellent leader? Oh boy. Um, I'm going to just, I just want to mute myself to the cough. Um, I didn't want you all to get COVID, you know what I mean? Uh, I probably should put on my mask. Um, I think there are, um, You, you, one 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 leader in business that comes to mind is is the fellow that runs uh, Marriott Hotels. Uh, his name is Arnie somebody. Uh, somebody could look that up for me. And um, he he's got a lot of empathy. He understands um, what he has to do, and he understands the problem in America. And I think at at um, many levels, he's almost one of your best optimal leaders. I think there are a lot of optimal leaders in, in corporate America. I just don't follow them all that closely. 
Um, and I don't really particularly want to talk politics because that's not the purpose of this. Um, um, it just, you know, gets bogged down and yeah. um, it, it, it won't solve anything in it. Uh, but uh, I think the best leaders, the optimal leaders are the ones who want to continue to grow. And if you have a mindset that you want to continue to grow, you'll be an optimal leader. Because if you don't know the answer, you'll figure it out. I used to have a saying that I sort of trademarked called uh, true leaders transcend from knowing the answer to seeking the answer. And if that makes sense, you know, we all think we might know the answer. But if you're, um, if you don't know the answer, you have to transcend from knowing the answer to seeking the answer. And that is more important now than ever. So optimal leadership is going to be the leadership that uh, takes those companies now and uh, they actually do a lot better uh, when they come out of COVID. They're going to pivot, um, whether they pivot operationally or whether they pivot product line wise, uh, but they have to be open to new thinking. And that's what I would characterize as uh, an optimal leader. It looks like we're coming to the close of our uh, interview session before the open Q&A, but I did want to ask you one of the last questions we had in mind, and it actually speaks a bit to what you just shared about knowing versus seeking. Uh, it seems like there are times in leadership where it's actually good to stick to your guns and stay the course because you are certain that you have an insight that will take you to success. There are other times where it's very important to adapt and be open and flexible. And I noticed you identified AQ, adaptability quotient, as a metric of uh, success. I'm just wondering if, if you could speak to that issue of when it's best to stay the course and stick to your guns and when it's best to actually try to be open and flexible as a leader. Wow, that's a, that's a multifaceted question <laughs> and, and not easy to, um, um, to handle. I, I would say you, you have to stick to, a leader has to stick to your guns <clears throat> when they know more than most of the people in the organization. You know what I mean? They have access to information. Um, I'm going to read you some characteristics um, where that can derail leadership, if I may. Um, when a leader makes big decisions uh, without the staff dialogue, in other words, um, if, if he makes a big decision, and the staff isn't brought along and, you know, the followers, that can be very chaotic. Um, so there's some right ways and wrong ways to do, uh, to do this. Um, uh, a leader doesn't uh, appreciate the devil's advocate point of view. Um, so we all have blind spots. Um, and and I, as I said, adaptability. Well, I tell you, if I were a CEO now, and uh, uh, I'm navigating the future. I want as I want as much input as I possibly can uh, uh, garner, because I don't have all the answers. And um, many minds uh, uh, think brighter and get a better result. The challenge I see with leaders is sometimes they'll ask a question of people that follow them in a way that elicits the answer they're looking for. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> what I mean by that is that um, they have a staff meeting, they wanna brainstorm a way forward, let's put it that way. And they say, well, here's what I'm thinking. And uh, you know, you have a team of five or six people, they just shut down uh, because, you know, why, why am I gonna risk my career on sort of, taking this guy on. So I, when I coach with my CEOs now, I say, listen, what you should do is get people to sub bubble up their ideas. And then as a leader, you can build upon them uh, and you can take issue with them or you can ask a question. Have you thought about it like this or you thought about it like that? So it's really, really important um, when leaders, uh, particularly if they have a strong voice, they're gonna want followership. And because there's plenty of times when leaders are, are uh, uh, have a strong voice, but they can't get anybody to follow them, and they're sort of out on a on a on a limb. 
And you see, and by the way, you see this a lot when new leaders come in at the top uh, and they're gone by uh, 18 months because they get out of the way ahead of, of the rest of the organization. So they're so anxious to develop their voice. I'm right, and I'm gonna develop my voice and everybody will follow me because I'm the boss. And what, what you have is um, what I call um, organ rejection. The, the, um, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the organization rejects the leader and the leader finds himself on the on a uh, outside looking in and the board sees us and the board uh, says you know we've got to make a change so this is this you know it's a delicate game i guess is what i'm trying to say And on that note, I am going to jump in. Hello, everyone. Kristen here again, here with, uh, we do have one question. Um, so attendees, if you do have any questions, go ahead and send them our way. Um, not sure if you're the correct person to ask this, Phil, but Andres asks, is it true that Betty solves more problems while sleeping uh, than, than awake, I believe is the... Um, well, I think all the, uh, um, all the people in... Uh, psychology and social sciences would say more stuff is done at the subconscious level than at a conscious level. So whatever she did at the conscious level, I think was worked over two or three times in the unconscious level. But I, I don't know it for fact, but I'm only following sort of what goes on in science and probably presumably so. I think that sounds sound to me. Uh, and we are, we don't have any other questions at the moment. So Sam or John, if you do want to continue on, I'll just, um, I'll pipe up when there is another question. Well, let's encourage our um, uh, listeners to ask questions. Yeah, so we do have, I, I, I'm, I may not come back. I may be, I may be asked never to come back. Just kidding. <laughs> well, I certainly hope not. Um, I, I like having you here, of course, uh, but we, we've spoken a couple times before, Phil. Um, I do see we still have 12 attendees. Some people did have to run off, it looks like. And Colson asks, what's one book you would recommend to all of your coaching clients? Oh, oh man. How about, I, how about I send you a list sometime? I right. think that would be great. Yeah, you send yeah. me the list and I'll, I'll get I'm, it out to all the students. So, so much is going on in my brain that it's hard for me to even uh, uh, think about it because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at books every day, sort of uh, different ones, um, dealing with change, uh, emotional intelligence. The whole well, I know you've, you've mentioned at least three in our discussion just today. Uh, so I, I'm sure you have a wealth of, of books you can share. Uh, thank you for getting me that list. And Colson, I will get that to you uh, via the All Hippos channel. Any other questions? It should be live. I don't believe there's a delay on the Zoom webinar here. While we wait for uh, one question, do you have one ready to go, Sam or John? Um. I have a bit of a question. Um, going back to diversity, um, there's what I like to think of as visual minorities and then there's invisible minorities. So an example of an invisible minority might be someone with a mental disability oh. or uh, how do we support people like that? That's a, that's a, really, um, that's a really great question. Um, we, we, we as a society have to create opportunities for these people. So for example, I go to the local grocery store and I see some of these people actually working in the grocery store, even though they're sort of uh, uh, emotionally impaired and mentally impaired. Uh, believe it or not, I, I have a, a CEO that um, um, his business is uh, making wheelchair ramps for people that are homebound because they uh, have wheelchairs and ADA. So that all came about because ADA was sort of in, initiated, I don't know the year, which made uh, that sector of society sort of more equal. You know, they have the 
pavements that get uh, uh, done. And he's in the business of creating uh, mobile ramps for uh, people that so they can get outside and, and so forth. So there's businesses that can ha help these people. And there's opportunities for us as employers to uh, uh, help these uh, people and give them jobs where um, most of them have probably very big hearts and can do just as well as anybody else in there. And, and that's, a, that's a part of an organization where they see diversity as really an important corporate objective. I, I, tell, my, uh, I tell my CEOs, my companies, don't start down this path unless you're going to continue to pursue it. Don't, don't, don't say uh, I'm going to be diverse and then say, well, <laughs> business got in the way. I said, once you start down, you better go. And you better be able to figure out how to measure your effectiveness and how, and how you're doing about, uh, about it. Uh, so the words, I mean, behaviors are much, much more important than uh, words. Did that partly answer your question? Oh, that was an excellent answer. I... Yeah, and if there's time, I did have one more. I was, I was curious about uh, the introduction of the concept of AQ. Um, I've heard for a time about emotional intelligence and how that, that can be a factor. But previously, I'd always thought of adaptability as kind of a facet of intelligence, the ability to like recognize uh, patterns and work within them. Um, but obviously, there was a need to identify adaptability as a separate metric to, to study. And I was just curious, it was, there were two parts to the question. Do you remember how and when that was introduced into the culture of coaching and leadership research? And also, have you seen examples of people who have, you don't have to name them, but people who have low IQ, but high AQ or vice versa? Um, that's, a, that's a very fascinating question. First of all, I'm, I'm still doing research on AQ. So I just looked at some papers this morning, some written in 2004 talking about the relationship of EQ and AQ. And I'm trying to sort of dig into that and get a little bit. What got me started on this was a, uh, a woman who did a TEDx talk and I can't, her name doesn't come to my mind, but she was in the investor business. And uh, she says, I don't care about IQ or EQ. I care about AQ, adaptability quotient. And uh, her questions to the investors was, what happens if your sales go away? Well, you better be adaptable, right? So she came up with this um, uh, nomenclature, uh, AQ, and that sort of sparked my interest in this. And then the same individual I uh, mentioned, Ryan Gottfriedson um, from uh, Southern California has this mindset assessment and he, he likes to think of it as an agility uh, quotient, um, kind of the same thing, agility and being able to be flexible. Um, so, you know, I call it adaptability. He calls it agility. I'm not going to argue with the guy. Um, but it, it, it's, it's the uh, same thing. I, I haven't done enough work yet to determine um, whether AQ can stand on its own. My guess is it can't. It just, it's, it's sort of, and when I, you guys have seen uh, my uh, little three three circles, right? Uh, first question I got from uh, when I first gave it to people is, should those circles be different sizes? That's so interesting. Yeah. We do value, I think as a society, we value certain aspects more like face value. However, like adaptability, which we don't talk about often, I think is more important than intelligence, but we value intelligence more. Yeah. Interesting. If I can respond very, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say, I really appreciate you tying it to the metaphor of agility. That makes a lot of sense for me because I often think about mental capacity as like a, it could be thought of as a, in a metaphor of uh, physical capacity. Like some people are physically strong, but they're not flexible, they're not agile, they're not coordinated and vice versa. So maybe we can think about mental capacity in those same dimensions. I really like your tying it to that. And that's maybe the really good, maybe I should change it to agility quotient. Um, but I haven't seen anything in, in the literature dealing with the 
So, I, you know, I'm still in the early stages of researching this. And by the way, um, as I looked at the IQ, uh, EQ, and AQ, it may have different sizes for where, uh, so if you're coming into your career, it may have different, you know, uh, the, the size of the circles may be different. So I originally was thinking about writing a book called, called uh, Entry Level become a manager, become a leader, and sort of what's that path look like? Well, that could, that sounds like that's about 25 years worth of work. Um, so I might, I might have to sort of cut down the size of that project. Um, but this whole notion of, uh, of uh, being an optimal leader is something that uh, speaks to me. And um, I'm still looking for ways to become a better leader myself. So even in my ripe young age, I keep trying to figure that out. And it looks like we've got about four minutes left. I do want to open it up. I haven't gotten any other questions, um, but we are still here for them. Um, and before we wrap up, I just wanted to say thank you for all of our attendees and panelists and Phil for, for joining. I think we've had a wonderful conversation. Um, and, and I have a, a ton of notes and I need to think and digest a lot of what you said uh, personally. So just, just, I wanted to make sure we said thank you before we, uh, before yeah. we wrapped up here. Well, it's been my honor to uh, sort of be uh, the family representative um, to uh, uh, opine on this. Um, Betty has uh, two daughters and one of them is active in, uh, in, um, in Maryland uh doing her thing and the other is i think on the west coast somewhere but uh um they're not as actively involved in the holberton school as i am i'm actually more actively involved than they are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we really appreciate it <laughs> um and and i think uh, whether or not i know we've had a couple conversations phil about how you're not really a tech person um and, but i think the the topics you discuss are important for any any um, you know anyone can be a leader no matter what field you're in right? right and how do we build these skills um and i think i think that's so important for us to talk about so thank thank you for sharing your wisdom and and i can't wait for that book list well i, I have one more uh, comment if you uh, yes, so please. when i was in the movie business general cinema movie uh, it was a half a billion dollar exhibition business we had 300, 300 movie theaters and 1,500 screens. And I had the IT department reporting to me. So uh, I, listen, I didn't know what they did, but they, it, it, I, you know, I kind of knew what they did, but I didn't, you know, if you asked me to do it, I couldn't do it. <laughs> so um, so uh, there became a point where IBM said they weren't going to support uh, um, one of their software packages. They're going to run the uh, change to MVS or something like that. I, I, it's been so long ago, I can't remember. So we as an organization had to sort of change our operating system in order to sort of be supported by IBM. And uh, I found that, I mean, I discovered this job was far bigger than me, far bigger than our organization. So we got, went out and hired a team that actually could come in and and work with us and uh, help us uh, do this. So, even though I I, I liken the um, I liken the challenge to changing jet engines at forty thousand feet in the uh, so over the weekend we had to change from OS to MVS in order to get and come back out on Monday morning. Different screen showing and the whole nine yards, but had the organization just sort of keep going and a heartbeat and then there came a piece on a Saturday night where we weren't quite sure whether we could go forward or back. They apparently they had to, I, I don't know, I, I didn't fully understand it to be honest with you. My job was to be the uh, uh, pep, you know, the uh, cheerleader of the mm -hmm. whole group mm -hmm. and uh, sort of make sure they uh, were able to celebrate their victory. Um, but that's my closest my closest responsibility to IT is having responsibility to, you know, getting that done. And, and it was more about leadership than it was anything else. And so we had a, we had a guy that um, was programming for film 
Um, mm. you know, how do you account for film and all that? I said, the best way to do that is go sit in the film department. Go sit next to your users. So you're right where they are because then you become buddies with them. If, yeah. you, sit, if you sit in a room by yourself uh, and, and think you know the answers, I guarantee you won't know the answers if you're sitting actually next to them. So um, those are some of the, um, some of the uh, activities that I sort of discovered, stu stumbled across uh, along the way. You know what I mean? What, what makes organizations more effective uh, than others? Well, th thank you for sharing it. I, I think that's that's quite a feat in one weekend to trans uh, move over what fifteen hundred screens. You were saying that's ridiculous. And well, the entire IT to, uh, functionality. I mean, it was it was huge. But we wow, you know the the team that was working on it was working on it for six months. So uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And then as a <clears throat> anyway, we're 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 past nine, so I don't I don't want to keep your <laughs> your time. I'm sure you have other calls, Phil. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that with us. My and pleasure. For your time, yeah. And thank you, attendees. If you have any other questions for Phil, um, he is on Slack. I don't know how active, um, so don't bombard him all at once. But if you have a leadership question or if you want to do another one of these, I'm willing to set this up um, and and make the time um, if if we have the the interest. Uh, so thank you again um, and have a great rest of your day everyone. Thank you for hosting and thank you our panelists for engaging me. Yeah they had some great questions today. Yeah very much so. Cool. Thank you everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop the webinar. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.